Last week, um, we covered the remaining section of chapter 3, uh, verses 14 through 21. That section, if you'll recall, was the Apostle Paul praying that God would strengthen the inner man. In fact, verse 16 reads that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. This is really crucial to the Christian life. The strength of the inner man for the Christian will determine the strength of that man's Christian walk. If the inner man is weak, the Christian walk is weak. And Paul realizes the importance of this inner strength and realizes the ultimate source of that strength being God, which is the very reason he prays what he prays. If you're not already there, you can go ahead and open your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 4 which will be where we start this morning, chapter 4. But in speaking of this inner strength, Paul often references physical strength and even sports to demonstrate the importance of having strength in the inner man. Of course, we mean spiritual strength, godliness, right? In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9, verses 23 through 27, Paul says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. He goes on to say, everyone who competes in the games, think of Olympic games, exercises self-control in all things. We understand this, right? Uh, Olympians, they don't eat certain things. They have rigorous sleep schedules. They have rigorous gym schedules. Everything's planned and precise, and they take very good care of what they do and why they do it. So Paul is likening this to him. He says that they exercise self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. And so Paul is speaking here of the discipline of the Christian life. It isn't a haphazard just kind of hope that we fall into the Christian life. It doesn't work that way. He goes on to tell Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.8, he says, For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So the Apostle Paul realizes that as much as athletes care for the physical body, we should care about our spiritual walk. We should care about our inner strength. Now, I should say it's a good thing to take care of our physical bodies, right? We need to do that. We need to take care of our outer strength. But we also need to then come to understand that it is a far better thing that we concern ourselves with our inner strength. We're often very concerned about the outer strength, and many believers are not as concerned about their inner strength. And we need to be. We understand that as we grow older, our physical strength will diminish. That is inevitable. Our bodies will undoubtedly become weaker. That's inevitable. But our inner man should be becoming stronger and stronger as we get older, as we exercise the disciplines of the faith, as we read the word, as we pray, as we study, as we do family devotions, as we serve. All of these things are things that God uses to strengthen our inner man through the work of the Holy Spirit when it's done in a heart of love and service to the Lord. So Paul recognizes this all while praying that God would be the one doing the work in our sanctification as we're obedient. And that was the majority of our text last week. Towards the end of our text last week, we went on to talk about a particular phrase, and the phrase was was so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. If you'll recall, that phrase is not speaking about the initial indwelling of the Spirit at the time of salvation. 
How do we know that? Well, because Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, right? These are already believers, and so he's not talking about the initial indwelling. No, he's speaking to people who are already believers. They already have Christ. They already are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And so what did he mean by so that Christ may dwell in your hearts? We spoke about that. It means that Christ would be comfortable in your heart. In other words, does your life reflect the fact that Christ lives in you? And that was the Apostle Paul's point. We used an illustration from a little book I showed you that earlier, which we have available on the back table. And the book illustrates how the man, who's the main character in the book, takes Jesus through a tour of his home, his heart. For instance, the library room in the book represents the man's mind, and he recounts the story of how he takes God to this library, Jesus, after he's saved. And Jesus is looking around at the books and the magazines on his shelf and on his table, and he realizes that there are books and magazines that he says Christ was too holy to even look at. And so those were things he needed to get rid of in his life. And so in the end of that scene in the little booklet, he asks Jesus to help him clean that room. And so he does. This is all centered around Paul's statement, so that Christ may dwell in your heart, so that Christ would be comfortable in your home. And so it's a good illustration. In other words, again, does your life reflect the type of life that Christ would be comfortable with? If you had to take a tour, if you had to give Jesus a tour in, in your heart, in your home, is what that's illustrated, and you had to take Jesus through all of the things that you love, your ambitions, your desires, your bank account, your thoughts, would he be comfortable in all of those rooms? And so that was really last week's point. Ultimately, Paul's prayer at the ending was that through the strengthening of the inner man, as you become stronger in Christ and more disciplined in Christ and more holy and sanctified, his prayer was that you would be able to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. And so then we come to our text this morning, which flows out of all of that which Paul has been saying up to now. Let me go ahead and read the first portion of chapter 4 for context, and then I really want to just spend the rest of the morning on verse 1. Ephesians 4, 1 through 6 will be what I read to give you some context. It says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a, worthy, in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, there's a division in the letter of Ephesians itself. When we get to chapter 4, we've sort of hit a turning point here. Um, in chapters 1 through 3, the Apostle Paul really focuses on doctrine, right? The fact that you have been predestined to become sons and daughters of Christ. You've been redeemed. You've been adopted. All that wonderful doctrine we've gone through in chapters 1 through 3. In chapter 4, the focus has changed a little bit from 4 to 6. Now he's going to focus on the practical application. So we have all this doctrine. We understand that we are children of God, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that now we're alive in Christ. But how do we now live out all of that doctrine? How do we respond to one another? How, do we, how are we supposed to look as a church, as the body of Christ? He's going to be very practical in these last three chapters. We're really going to now start focusing on what the Christian life within the church and towards one another look like. Of course, he never leaves doctrine altogether, but that's the focus of these last few books. If you were to break Ephesians up, the first three, doctrine, the last three, practice and living. 
So chapter 4's overarching theme as a whole chapter is on the Christian walk, and it's divided up into two major parts. So we're going to go through these very slowly, but verses 1 through 16, the first section of chapter 4, is really speaking about our walk in the context of unity. And then the second half, verses 17 through 32, is our walk in terms of holiness. We're going to spend quite a fair amount of time in chapter 4. A long time in chapter 4. Uh, and, and that is very simply because our goal isn't to get through the text as quickly as possible. But we want to let it conform us into the image of Christ as we come to understand the truths in it. And we want to be able to apply them to our lives. And so slowly and methodically is how we'll go through chapter 4. In fact, I would argue that a great many problems within the church would be resolved and, and even avoided if we could just get this one chapter right. If we just got this one chapter right, the church in general would look entirely different than it does. And so I don't want to breeze through it without carefully considering everything that God has for us here. This chapter, not unlike any others, but this chapter would certainly be chapters that if you're going to miss, you want to pull up on the website and listen to the sermons that you miss. Of course, we'd encourage you to do that for all of them, but um, you certainly want to do that here for this chapter. Well, with that having been said, let's go back to verse 1, where we're going to spend our morning. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. Now, whenever we see the word therefore in Scripture, we must ask ourselves just what is it there for? And that's how we can remember that. Well, you see, the Apostle Paul, what has he just been speaking about? Most immediately, he's been speaking about the strength of the inner man, the dwelling of Christ in our hearts in such a way that Christ is comfortable in us. In other words, that the house of the heart is a clean house there's nothing there that Christ would be uncomfortable with. And he finishes the section in chapter 3 with a prayer that we would be filled up to all the fullness of God. So his therefore in chapter 4 is then in light of all of what he's just been saying. Not only in chapter 3, but really it's in light of all he's been saying up to this point. Paul's gone into some of the most beautiful doctrines of the Christian faith, doctrines that are so high and so grand that we ought to walk away with a greater sense of awe and amazement. And so in light of all of the doctrine he's given us in the first three chapters, in light of everything that he's said and he's revealed in chapter 1 through 3, he now comes to the application of those doctrines, and so thus he says, therefore. In other words, he's saying, listen to what I'm now about to tell you because of all that I have been teaching you. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. His whole aim has been from the beginning, the beginning of Ephesians, to speak about this call. And so he has. But before we come to the call, let us briefly notice that the apostle makes mention of his imprisonment again. I mean, he did this in chapter 3, right? So the Ephesians already know that he's in prison. They already know that he's chained to soldiers in Rome. But this time he says it in a slightly different way. In chapter 3... He says, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles. But here he says, I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord. Well, we understand that the Apostle Paul isn't just being repetitive for repetitive sake, right? He's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so there's a reason that he is yet again saying this. And there's a specific reason that he says it the way he does. It's intentional. Here, he's a prisoner of the Lord. And then he proceeds to say, I implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. 
You see, he's a prisoner of the Lord. In other words, it is this very calling of which he's speaking for which he's a prisoner. This calling that he's speaking to us about now is the reason he's a prisoner It's the very same calling in which he's imploring us to be found worthy of. It's almost as though Paul is really saying to the reader, I understand that what I am about to say can be costly because I myself am paying the cost and living out this very walk. And so in a very gentle pastoral way, he's reminding them that he is a prisoner. So just what is this call? What, what is this call that he's speaking of? Well, we have said that Paul has been speaking of it the entire time in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, he identifies the beginning of this call when he says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. That's the beginning of the call. That we would be holy and blameless before him. In verse 4, he speaks of the call. He goes on to say he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. That's the call again in verse 18, chapter 1, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? This is the calling to which he's referring. In other words, our calling is the calling to the Christian life, your salvation. It's a calling to a new life. In chapter 2, we're told that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we lived in the lusts of the flesh, that we were children of wrath, that once we walked according to the ways of this world and of the prince of the power of the air, that we walked as sons of disobedience. And so our calling is one from death, from sin and trespasses into glorious life with Christ. That's the calling. We were called from children of wrath to be adopted as children of God. That's the calling. And this is the calling of which Paul is speaking of here, the Christian life. We see throughout the chapters this call move from being an individual sphere to the church sphere in chapter 2. Well, what do I mean by that? It starts out by telling each one of us that you are predestined for adoption as sons and daughters. In chapter 2, Paul reveals this grand mystery, and we move from the individual sphere of our calling to a collective sphere, and that's the unity between Jews and Gentiles. Remember, there's only one church now. There's no more Jew, there's no more Gentile, there's no more male, there's no more female, there's no more slave, there's no more master. If you are in Christ, you're one family. There's no such thing as a black church or a white church or a Korean church or a Japanese church or an American church. It's just the church. And anyone who says otherwise contradicts and fights against the scriptures and what God himself has done. God has brought the church and unified it. One Father, one church. Because of this call, this call to salvation, and this call that unifies us as a corporate body, Paul now implores us to walk in a manner that is deemed worthy. Before we move on too quickly this morning, I want to speak about the word implore. There's some very interesting words in our passage this morning. The word implore here really demonstrates the Apostle Paul's pastoral heart. It shows that part, uh, it really shows the part and aim and focus of every, the calling of every pastor. Particularly, this is one of the fundamental jobs of a pastor. It's every pastor's duty to implore his people, the people he shepherds, to live an obedient, worthy life to Christ. It's my job, it's every pastor's job to do this. The word implore here means to ex- exhort. Sorry, not extort, exhort. It means to exhort. It carries a heaviness and has intensity behind it. It's made significant and authoritative by the fact that Paul chooses to use the personal pronoun and his position as a captive before he implores. And so there's quite a lot of force behind this word. 
In other words, this is of utmost importance, that you walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. The apostle here isn't merely making a suggestion. This isn't an option. It's not a good idea. This is a divine standard. If we'll remember the apostle Paul speaking here does so not on his own accord independently. He does so by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So this is not a choice. It's not a good idea. It's not an option. It's also not for some elite group of Christians. This call to walk in a worthy manner isn't just for pastors. It's not for theologians. It's not just for seminary professors. It is a divine standard for anyone who claims to be Christian. It's a divine standard for every single believer. Now, the fact that there is a way to walk in a manner that's worthy of our profession of faith means that we could also walk in an unworthy way, right? We understand that. If there's a worthy way, then we certainly can walk in a way that's unworthy. And so the Apostle Paul is pleading here, imploring us to walk in a worthy manner. He's no stranger to pleading with people, by the way, and he never apologizes for pleading with people to do what is right and to avoid what's evil. And in 2 Corinthians 2.8, Paul urges the Corinthians. In the book of Acts, Paul pleads with King Agrippa. In Romans 9, we see the same urgency, the same intense feeling with what Paul urges the Ephesian church and us today. Let me just read that to you because this is the same passion behind the use of the word implore by the Apostle Paul. When the Apostle Paul writes to the Romans in chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, you can just listen. He says, I am telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated for Christ for the sake of my brethren the kinsmen, according to the flesh. I mean, Paul was so passionate here in Romans that he was saying, I wish I could be damned if it would save them. That's Paul pleading, imploring, and this is the same kind of intensity behind our passage this morning from the Apostle Paul. And so he implores us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling I mean, we do understand this call to walk in a worthy manner, even in the world we live in today, right? We understand the need to conform to certain things. We, we, we get that. If you work for a certain company, you have to conform to their way of doing things, right? You have to work in a way that's worthy of where you work. You take on the company name. You represent the company And if you do something that's in disagreement with the company policy, it makes the company look bad because you're their representative. We get this even in a worldly perspective. I mean, this is why when you sign on to a job with certain expectations, if you can agree to those expectations, or if you fail to conform in a proper way, you either give notice or you get fired, right? It's the same if you own your own business. You hire people with an expectation of them working in a certain way and if they don't meet your standards if they don't meet your expectations then they're not fit to work in your company and either they leave or you fire them so we do understand this premise just humanly speaking now if you go back quite a bit further in time in history which i think is perhaps maybe a little more akin to the reality of our passage this morning Let's talk about the time when children in the family reflected the values of that family. There was a time when society would look at the child and attribute whatever that child was doing or how they were acting to the family name, right? It meant something. The child was a representative of the family. There was never a time where they could take a break from the family name. And what they did in the community would either be in line with the family values or it would be against that family's values. And the family would develop a reputation, right? I mean, by the way, that's still important today. Children ought to live in such a way to bring honor 
to their family, and they do that by upholding their family values. And of course, for the Christian, the family value should be derived, at least at their core, from Scripture. But this is the very thing that the Apostle Paul understands and is urging us to do here, that we walk in a manner worthy of our Heavenly Father as children that bear His name. Remember in chapter 1, we're told that we're predestined to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ of God. If you go back far enough in, in, in world history, it was often true that someone would say, I'm Nathaniel, son of Ricky Jolly, right? And so there was a family name attached. And the things that the people in that family did were how that family was judged by those around and this is the very same thing we're called to as christians your family name is that of christ and so paul beckons us to walk in a way that's worthy of that name i think we've established the fact that we have to walk in a worthy manner but i want to look at what that looks like a little more closely, specifically the just the word walk. Let's start there. The word walk here means the same. There are eight times it's used in the book of Ephesians, and it's used in the same way. It refers to one's conduct or lifestyle. I think that's pretty clear given the context, right? How you live, especially as it goes on into the next verse to describe some of the characteristics of this walk, and we'll get to that um, I guess in a few weeks' time. Now, what isn't perhaps as obvious is some of the grammar in this word. And while I don't like to make a big deal out of that often, it's particularly interesting here because in the original language, this word walk is what we call an ingressive aorist tense. What does that mean and why does that matter? The ingressive aorist tense, when used, is used to say that something has begun. This is the beginning of a thing. It's something new. It's something that has just been entered into. In other words, because of the grammar used in this word, the walk indicates that this is a new way of walking. It's a new way of living. It's a new lifestyle or conduct from what it was previously. There's a change. Well, if you'll remember in chapter 2, how did we walk previously? We were actually told this, right? We were told that we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we walked in the world's way. We were told that we were children of wrath. We get to verse 4, and it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, and at that moment, this new walk should begin. And so the word walk here is indicative of a change in your life from the way you used to walk as an unbeliever to now the way you should walk as one who bears the name of Christ. Now we're to walk in a way that's worthy of this new life that we have, different from the four before we used to walk as children of wrath. Now we are to walk as children of God. I mean, if you just think of a child that's been adopted, the picture that's given here throughout the years I've had the privilege of knowing several men who have adopted children, some younger, some older, some informal, some in legal ways. Um, but one thing was true for every adopted child. Once they were adopted, what happens? They come under a new roof with new rules and new expectations. They take on a new name. They had to leave the old ways, the old expectations, the old rules behind them from wherever they came from. When they came into the new house, everything had to be changed. And this is the very heart of our passage. We used to be children of wrath walking in the ways 
of the world and of the ways of Satan. Now we've been adopted and as children of God, bearing a new name, coming under a new, a new house, we have a new father. And so now we're to walk in a way that's worthy of our new house. This is the picture that we have here. We move on in the passage and we come to the word worthy. It's another very interesting word. The word in the Greek literally means bringing up the other beam of scales. So if you want to look at your passage and see that word there, the Greek word literally means bringing up the other beam of scales. It's the idea of balancing the scales. In other words, that our life is equal to our position as sons and daughters in Christ. If you were to put a weight on one side of the scale, which is the fact that you are a son or a daughter of the living God, and you were to put another weight on the other scale, which was your life, would they balance? That's what the word worthy literally means. To bring up the other beam of scales. Would the scales be balanced should someone measure our life against our claim to Christianity? This is the way in which the word is used. And so that's how they've come to translate it as worthy of the calling. Is your life balanced in relation to your calling? In Philippians 1.27, Paul says... Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. In Colossians 1.10, it says, So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. I mean, this is a common theme throughout Scripture. There is a an expectation. The one who professes Christ is to walk in a way that equals the calling. Are the scales of your life balanced? This is what Paul is imploring us. He's imploring us to balance those scales. We should all have the desire to live in a way that's worthy. We should all desire to see one another live in a way that's worthy. We're all part of the same family. And in some sense, the Christian family is the realest family we have because you'll spend all of eternity with this family. That's not to diminish our families here on earth. But because we belong to the same family, we should all desire to spur one another on to live in a way that's worthy. It's not just the pastor's job. It's just not the elder's job of the church. It should be the desire of every believer to encourage one another to live in a way that pleases God. This is the expectation. And so we see we have a calling. We see what that calling is. It's the Christian life. We see that we're to walk in a specific manner. We even understand the expectation of a plea, right? We have a new name. We have a father. We're his sons. And so what we do reflects on him. We understand the expectation. But we're still left with a question as to what this walk is to look like. And for the rest of our time this morning, I want to spend answering that question. And I want to answer it in two ways. I want to answer it from the negative view And I want to answer it from the positive view. In other words, what does, the worthy, what does an unworthy walk look like so that we better understand then what a worthy walk looks like? And then we'll move to the positive side, which is just very simply what a worthy walk looks like. Of course, there are several characteristics that are going to be given in the very next passage. You probably We've already read those this morning. We're going to take quite a bit of time going through verse 2 and 3, but at the moment I want to consider it a little more broadly. And what better place than that which we've been so recently, Ephesians chapter 2, when speaking of the negative side, gives us a clear picture of a life that is unworthy of Christ, dead in your sins, walking according to this world. Right? Verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2. 
It's sad when I think that many professing Christians never really leave the ways of this world. We've seen that in pretty blatant ways over the last few years, especially they never really separate themselves from the ways of the world. And to be quite frank, I could not be convinced personally, even after a hundred years, that one who is truly saved, that they are saved if they continue to love the world after professing Christ. You would never convince me that that person really is saved. I cannot and I will not believe that a Christian could have a distaste for the things of God while loving the world and still be a true Christian. That just is not what we see in Scripture. But this is an unworthy walk. An unworthy manner would be doing what we did when we were dead in our sins and trespasses. Right, and so either Scripture is confused, which is not, or there are a lot of professing Christians out there that just very simply aren't Christian at all. And we have to recognize that. We went through the whole book of Jude. The entire book of Jude is a book that says there are fake Christians hidden in your midst and beware of them. Entire book written just on that. And contending for the truth that is in Scripture. So we recognize that, but this is an unworthy way of walking. If a life doesn't change at all from before they were a Christian to the time they profess to be a Christian, then that life hasn't been renewed. It just hasn't. Well, the passage in chapter 2 goes on to say that we formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. This is the way of an unworthy walk, living according to every lust and desire rather than fleeing from temptation. The way of those without Christ is to indulge in sin, to entertain it, and to feed on it. That's an unworthy walk. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from every form of evil. The unworthy life is one that, rather than abstaining from sin, indulges and seeks it out. We have a pretty long list in Corinthians of the sort of thing that would certainly constitute as unworthy. Actually, in fact, why don't you just turn there with me for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll give you a moment to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Verses 9 through 11. It says this, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. People can profess whatever they like, but if they're one of these men, the scripture is very clear. They're not Christian. But then it goes on to say, such were, past tense, some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And so there certainly is hope for those who live that way, but they aren't Christian. But those who engage in such things that mentioned in the passage here are walking in an unworthy manner. Those who are sexually promiscuous, those who have idols. By the way, idolatry is huge in America, and it's not what you might think of. An idol is not merely a statue of some known or unknown deity that you bow down to in your home or your yard or whatever to worship. An idol isn't just the little Buddha that you can find. It certainly can be that, but an idol, by definition, is, can be also anything that we place above God. We can make family an idol if that were to become something that causes us to choose to be unfaithful to God. Sports can become an idol if we choose that over God. For others, it could be video games 
or television or social media. There are a lot of things that we could put higher in value over God, and those things would be idols. Idols are those things that effectively replace our worship and our trust in God with something else. For some people, it's food. And it is unworthy as a walk. Adulterers, those who are effeminate, are all walking in an unworthy manner. Homosexuals, there's a growing movement in our society and even within the church today that's trying to convince people that you can be an effeminate Christian man. Well, you can be an effeminate man, but you're not Christian. There's an entire movement in the church that tries to convince us that there's a category called the Christian homosexual. But those things, according to the pastor, is unworthy of Christ. And certainly there can be redemption. But if that is the walk, it is an unworthy walk. Theft, in our passage, this should go without saying, right? Someone who's given themselves to stealing is walking in an unworthy walk manner we get that drunkenness and revilers a reviler is someone who speaks in an abusive or contemptuous way to another person so someone who is angry as a person or often uh, is often a reviler covetousness are we content with what we have or are we always wishing what our neighbors or others have i mean this whole list is just a sample okay it's not it's just a sample of characteristics of things that an unworthy walk would include. And then the passage goes on to say very clearly, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Walking in an unworthy way is to reject a life pursuant to holiness. Working, walking in an unworthy way is to reject a life pursuant to to holiness. I think we've definitely learned in our society it's not as much what someone says as what they do, right? Because what we do comes out of the heart. The positive side. I think we need to know both. While we're here in this passage in Corinthians, stay there. I want to go back to verse 11. This is the positive side. What does the worthy walk actually look like? We know what it doesn't look like. What does it look like? Verse 11 says, Such were some of you, but you were washed. In other words, you're not filthy anymore. You were sanctified. You're now holy. But you were justified. You were under wrath. In the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. I mean, this is the very image of the word walk in our passage this morning. You were walking in these ways. Some were idolaters, some were thieves, some were revilers, but now, now you are different. Now you are washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. Now you must walk in a way that is worthy of the calling you are made new. We are sons and daughters of the king, the king. We're kingsmen and kingswomen, and we need to view ourselves that way, each one of us. We're, as Pilgrim's Progress refers to themselves, citizens of the celestial city. We're citizens of heaven. We bear the name of Christ. We're carriers of the gospel, which has the power to save people. We call ourselves disciples of Christ. And so Paul says we must strive to live a life worthy of all of that. And perhaps there's no greater verse in Scripture that describes what a worthy walk should be in such a succinct way as 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 says this, But like the Holy One who called you, God, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, Paul implores us to, could be boiled down to 
Very simply, be holy. Be holy in your speech. Be holy in your thoughts. Be holy in your actions. Peter says, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. The verse just before that in Peter, by the way, 14 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. In other words, now you walk in a different manner. The Bible is full of exhortations to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, and it often speaks to it using the language of holiness. We often speak of it in terms of sanctification. Sanctification, growing in holiness, is the or it's rather the process of growing, growing in holiness. It's our steady growth in learning to walk in a way, in a worthy manner. Paul to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. To the Romans, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. In other words, because of your calling to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You want to know how to worship God? Well, there it is. Offer your life as a holy sacrifice, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Romans 12.1 We gave you a, we went over a list of unworthy things. I want to kind of touch on a list of worthy things. Colossians 3, 8 through 17. It's a little lengthy passage, but let me just read it to you. It's really quite a glorious passage of the worthy walk. But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy, and beloved, now that's each one of you. You were chosen in God, and God views you as his beloved child. Put on a heart, here's your list, of compassion. Put on a heart of kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. This is a worthy walk. Because you were chosen of God, because you bear his name as his beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, forgiving one another. Let the peace of Christ Sorry, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, here's the worthy walk, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him through, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Purpose yourself to do everything you do in word or deed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Purpose yourself to give thanks to God through Christ in everything you do. This is a worthy walk. It's by no means an exhaustive list. 
there's plenty here that we'll spend a lifetime perfecting. And I want to say it's not about making a list of what not to do or what to do just so that we can check off a box. These are things that should be a desire born out of our love for Christ, our desire to please God, not just out of a duty. We certainly do have a duty because of the name we bear to walk in a worthy manner, but we should also desire to bring our Father a good reputation, and we do that by being obedient to his word. We're disciples of Christ, right? We refer to ourselves as disciples of Christ, and a disciple is meant to look like their teacher. I mean, the Apostle Paul knew this all too well. In fact, he began this very chapter with an acknowledgement that this high, worthy calling would be costly. As he gently reminds his readers of imprisonment, and I'll tell you, each one of you today, to walk like this will be costly. If you really want to walk in a manner worthy of Christ, you can, you have the strength of the Holy Spirit, but it's going to be costly. Jesus says things like, pick up your cross and follow me. If you want to save your life, you have to lose it first. Maybe we should put that on a banner outside. Come and suffer for Jesus with us. They'd be more honest. But we are the king's children. And he's given us what we need to walk in a way that's worthy. The Apostle Paul, if you ever do a person study in Scripture, start with the Apostle Paul. I mean, the Apostle Paul is a leader extraordinaire. He is just a man like each and every one of us, but he had come to view his whole life in light of how it would affect the name of Christ. Paul was deeply concerned about his walk, and he implores us to be concerned. Not just concerned, in fact, we must walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling, and we certainly can't do that in our own strength. But Paul's faithfulness and concern for his own walk led him to view his life in such a way that his desires were the desires of Christ. The things that Paul loved, he loved because those were the things that God loved. Is that how you gauge your desires? Is that how you determine what you love? Paul's mission was the mission of Christ. He often says he was a slave of Christ. Everything about the Apostle Paul's life was meant to serve God, and this is the attitude of a mature Christian. It doesn't mean we get it perfect. We understand we don't, right? But we do strive for that. We do strive to be holy because God is holy. We do strive to walk in a worthy manner because you are children of the king. You are a son of the king. You are a king's man and a king's daughter. So as we grow and mature in the Lord, as we're obedient to God's word, as we change how we view the world to be in line with God's word, we're promised that we're strengthened in the inner man as we're obedient. And as time goes on, little by little, as we walk in more obedience and in faithfulness, we find that our walk is little by little more and more worthy of the call. We're not talking about perfectionism. That's not possible. But do we long to walk in a way that's worthy of the call? Do we strive for that? We discipline our bodies. We train our bodies. We eat better. We exercise. We do all those things to strengthen our body. Do we give that same level of care, even greater we should give it, to our walk? We have the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, and so it's not... Merely that we walk alone, we don't. But as we are obedient, the Spirit of God empowers us to walk in this worthy way. And the only one who is truly known by God, the only one who is truly called, the only one who is truly a Christian will have a concern for the walk. You won't do it perfect. But the person who has no concern for their walk has no concern because they do not have the Spirit of Christ in them. 
the Christian, the one who was called, they will want to bring honor to their family, the family of God. They'll want to bring honor to their heavenly Father. And they'll want to walk in a manner that's worthy of God's grace given to them in their call. Let's pray.